Our next speaker is, is Ron Lasky. Ron is Emeritus Professor and Fellow. He also spoke at the 2015 symposium. Ron was the Charles Darwin Professor of Embryology. He's also one of the founders of the Wellcome Trust Cancer Research Gurdon Institute here in Cambridge. And he founded and directed the MRC Cancer Cell Unit. He served as Vice President of the Academy of Medical Science. Ron's honours are also numerous. He's a fellow of the Royal Society, has been awarded the CBE, and the Royal Society's Royal Medal for his contribution to works on screening methods for cancer diagnosis and work on control of DNA replication and nuclear protein transport. So, Ron, you're going to take us through Darwin DNA and cancer. Thank you very much. It feels very strange to be following in Andy's footsteps again, as we, exactly as we did 25 years ago. Um, I'm going to talk about Charles Darwin's extraordinary insight into several of the key issues of under, for understanding cancer. And in The Origin of Species, Charles Darwin wrote, can we doubt that individuals having any advantage, however slight over others, would have the best chance of surviving and procreating their kind. And this preservation of favorable individual differences and variations and the destruction of those which are injurious, I've called natural selection or survival of the fittest. Now, Darwinian selection is based on multiple tenets, one of which is the capacity of the population to overproduce the capability to produce more individuals than can survive. Secondly, variation within the population by mechanisms that Darwin did not understand at all, but he correctly anticipated their importance. And thirdly, if there is overproduction and variation, there would, and there are, if there are selective pressures, then those variants that are fittest to the environment they find themselves in uh, are those who will survive. There will be survival of the fittest or natural selection. Now, how are these relevant to cancer and DNA? Well, I hope to argue, uh, I hope to convince you that they're extraordinarily powerful insights into what happens to our cells in cancer. So, we can consider not just a population of individuals, but a population of cells. And the question arises, is there a capacity of the cell population to overproduce? Is there variation within the cell population? And are there selective pressures resulting in the fittest cell or individual? And this raises a paradox that there may be an apparent conflict of interest between the cell, which may want to go on proliferating as fast as it can, and the individual for which that tendency in cells could be potentially disastrous. So to reintroduce the concept of cells, and for those of you who heard my Darwin College lecture, uh, I think two and a half years ago, um, I'm going to use some of the same illustrations, but as you'll see, the theme of what I'm discussing is fundamentally different, even though I shall use several of the same illustrations, such as this one um, by the, uh, uh, produced by by our son, um, who has a, a strong professional interest in microscopy. But, so this is a rather beautiful cell, um, but there are seven billion humans on the planet, each of us consisting of a population of cells. So what do seven billion cells look like? Well, it may surprise you that seven billion cells would occupy the tip of my index finger. Um, so, the human body consists of a number of cells which are variously estimated as uh, 100, uh, as 100 trillion or, or 100 million million, um, or some estimates are that it's actually half that. So for the, to, for the avoidance of doubt, I'll concede that I may need two joints of my index finger to accommodate the 7 billion cells, but the number is still quite remarkable that we have 7 billion cells in uh, part of a finger. So they're very small. 
And as I've told you, the human body consists of 100 million million cells, and normal cells grow in nice, precise, orderly fashions, whereas cancer cells pile up, uh, grow on top of each other, and keep growing uh, when they shouldn't. Now, if all the cells in our body divided freely at the rate they can in culture, like these cells which are, are, are cultured, then we would double in size every 24 hours and be spherical. Now, some of us fear we have a tendency to double in size every 24 hours and be spherical, but fortunately, it's not quite that bad in reality. So something is restraining populations of cells. These are cells all stained red, but those which are in the division cycle are either proliferating or preparing to proliferate are also stained green, and green plus red in the microscope makes yellow. And so these are um, sections of human intestine, human bowel, and what you see is that the pattern of cells that are proliferating are very precise. These are very accurate patterns. Here there are groups of cells that are not proliferating. Here there is a ring of cells that is. So patterns of cell proliferation are very tightly regulated. Cells divide in the right place and at the right time. Of course, there are exceptions, and the exceptions are precancerous, as in this case for cervix, or cancerous, in this case of adenocarcinoma of the colon, um, where proliferation is almost a free-for-all. Uh, the very precise patterns of these are only the cells making DNA rather than all the ones preparing to divide. Now, these are only ones that are making, doubling their DNA. Um, and what you see is that in cancer, there is far more activity for making DNA and um, far more preparation for cell division. So cancer is a disease of unregulated cell proliferation. This is a normal red blood smear with the majority of, of red blood cells uh, and these white blood cells seen here. And in chronic myeloid leukemia that I shall return to in this talk, there is an excess of mature white blood cells. Um, in this case, which I won't be talking more about, there is an excess of immature white blood cells uh, as well. But the key point that I want to draw your attention to is that cancer is a disease of unregulated cell proliferation. So a very common question is why is cancer so common? Because one third of us will experience cancer in, a, in our lifetimes and for a quarter of us at current rates, uh, it will be the cause of our death, at least uh, the figures in the UK. So the obvious question is, why is cancer so common? But a colleague of mine, Gerard Evan, who is the professor of biochemistry here, pointed out that that's the wrong question. And what we should be asking is, why is cancer so rare? Now, that sounds perverse if a third of us are going to experience it. But one selfish cell in our body of 100 million million cells can form a tumor. So why don't cells misbehave more often and why don't controls fail more often? It's an extraordinarily rare process. If um, criminal behavior or antisocial behavior in the human population was as rare as it is in the cell population in our bodies, then prison overcrowding would be a thing of the past because there'd be less than one person on the planet in prison at any one time. So our cells are extraordinarily tightly regulated and extraordinarily well behaved so that they don't misbehave more often and behave selfishly to divide when they shouldn't. There is an extraordinary regulation that prevents over proliferation of our cells. So to return to where Charles Darwin's insights lead us, Darwinian selection has evolved defenses against cells becoming cancerous. The first of these is that there are constraints that allow cells only to divide in the right place and at the right time to replace those that are worn out or, or die. And cell proliferation is tightly regulated uh, both spatially and temporally. Cells, compare, uh, cells care about what the neighbors think and they only divide uh, at the right time uh, in the interests of the, the individual body rather than selfishly dividing as fast as they could. Cancer arises when those controls go wrong. So the first level of uh, prevention of cancer 
that has arisen by cycles of Darwinian selection in our past is that cells only divide in the right place and at the right time. This is an image of cell division, for those of you who aren't familiar with it. The DNA in the chromosomes is stained red, or in the cell nucleus of this non-dividing cell here. And what you see is chrome, the DNA condenses into chromosomes, which are then pulled apart on a protein spindle that, pulls them, that um, mechanically separates them into two new nuclei, uh, which then function in the cell. So DNA, part of my title, the second component of my title, um, is stained blue in this image from our sun. Um, and DNA is the stuff that genes are made of. Um, the key thing is that it's the blueprint for everything that goes on in our cells. Uh, DNA tells the cell what to do and uh, how to behave as a responsible member of a cell population in our bodies. But before a cell can divide, it must duplicate its DNA content. Uh, and this will be more than familiar to some of you, I'm aware, but for those for whom it isn't familiar, I'll just briefly remind you that DNA is a double helix consisting of four letters which have to be duplicated. Uh, so every time there is a G in the original sequence, it will, be, uh, it will have C, it will specify that C is uh, built against it. Similarly, T will lead to A, A will lead to T, C to G. Uh, they base pair. Uh, as seen in this tie, um, where you will notice that the identity of the individual um, is uh, protected under the best interests of uh, medical confidentiality. Um, <laughs> but you may notice a certain resemblance to the, um, the profile of the person wearing the tie and your speaker. Um, so this tie is also technically incorrect. Um, and I challenged, I was asked to give the 450th anniversary lecture at my old grammar school and challenged the pupils to come up with it. I did the same in the Darwin College lecture here with the, the vice chancellor, the head of the clinical school, the previous head of the clinical school, um, and I think two Nobel laureates. Um, nobody put their hand up there, but in the school they got right the answer as to what is wrong with this image of a DNA double helix. Um, there is something fundamentally incorrect about it. But for the point I want to make here is that one DNA double helix becomes copied to make two progeny double helices, and this must happen before a cell can divide. And um, the scale of the challenge that, that poses is shown here. This book, where you'll see a uniform gray area here, it's made up of the letters A, T, G, and C, and it is part of the human genome. And this volume is actually this volume seen here. It's a large encyclopedia-like volume, this bookcase is standing on the floor in the Welcome Collection in the Euston Road and reaches the ceiling. And it contains 118 volumes, which together are the genome contained, the sequence contained in one cell. So this is a representation of the human genome, and it gives you some indication of the vast amount of information contained in each of our um, 100 million million cells. It's an extraordinary challenge to copy that precisely and accurately in such a way that um, errors are not introduced. Um, so to illustrate that another way, uh, again, harking back to, to Andy's talk, um, there are five, if I hold up my, my hand and lop off my five digits and extract the DNA from them, um, which I, I don't try this at home, but each of these cell, each cell in uh, each finger has two meters of DNA in each cell. Now, there are 200 million kilometers of DNA, therefore, in these five fingers, which is enough, if you put it end to end, it's enough to reach the sun. So just the DNA in my five fingers put end to end would reach the sun. Yet all of that DNA, two meters of DNA in each cell, containing the information shown in that 118 volumes in the Welcome Collection, all of that has to be copied faithfully. And if it's copied incorrectly, um, that can cause havoc by misbehavior of the cell 
which could then break, uh, break the rules I've told you about. Cancer is a disease of damaged DNA. And accurate copying, accurate repair mechanisms, and checkpoints that the cell must go through before it's allowed to divide all protect the information in DNA. And why this matters is that two classes of gene restrain our cell populations. They're called oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes, and I'm going to give you a quick illustration of each. Oncogenes control cell proliferation by switching it on, and they're often overactive in cancer cells, and as you can see, overactivity can have unfortunate consequences, like this train in a Paris station, uh, which, being overactive, went through the end wall. Um, conversely, tumor suppressor genes uh, have two types of function. Some tumor suppressor genes control cell proliferation by switching it off, like the handbrake on a car. Um, others safeguard DNA from mutagenic changes which would alter the behavior of the cell. These are often inactivated. Both types of tumor suppressor gene are often inactivated in cancer cells. Um, and examples include two of the breast cancer susceptibility genes, BRCA1 and BRCA2, that I'll return to later in the talk. So, these two classes of gene then, oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes, restrain cell populations. And mutations in these genes can drive overproduction of cells. So mutations that activate oncogenes or inactivate tumor suppressor genes can cause overproduction of cells, namely cancer. So to return to the criteria for Darwinian selection and why we have evolved, how we've evolved defenses against cells becoming cancerous, cells divide only in the right place and at the right time and information in DNA is protected against changes, i.e. mutations. But there's a third criterion, and it's illustrated here, that immortality is a rare privilege of our, within our cells. Only stem cells are immortal. Now, the first time I, devised, I designed this slide, and I apologize to those who heard me say it in a Darwin College lecture, but the first time I designed this slide, um, I designed it for a first-year undergraduate course that I give to 350 first-year undergraduates, and I realized, fortunately, just in time, that I was about to tell 350 first-years that immorality is a rare privilege, <laughs> as I missed out the letter T. What Freud would make of this, I dread to think. Um, fortunately, I corrected it in time. Um, but stem cells are the rare immortal cells in our body. So they can renew the, the, our tissues by division, an unequal division, to form another stem cell and a committed progenitor cell that divides a limited number of times to produce a differentiated uh, specialized cell, such as the, the blood cells, the cells that make bone, muscle, and all these things in the body. These will die after they've served their function, with rare exceptions, like our nerve cells, which are with us for most of our lives. Um, and these will also die after they've divided a limited number of times to make a differentiated end product cell. So these are the only immortal cells. Now what that means is if we, if we activate oncogenes or turn off tumor suppressor genes, in the majority of our cells, it's not going to matter um, because those cells will die unless a separate event occurs to immortalize that cell and make it behave like a stem cell. Another way of generating, and, and that could then generate cancer, which would then persist and go on dividing. These will divide a limited number of times, but then they'll die. And therefore, they won't produce a long-lived tumor that causes problems. So this is a further defense in the design of our bodies against uh, cancer. Again, Darwinian selection has evolved mechanisms to minimize the risk of cancer. Only these cells are immortal if these have activated oncogenes or uh, inactivated tumor suppressor genes, we're in serious trouble. Whereas these have to be separately immortalized to, to turn into cancer cells. Um, so, to return to the 
mechanisms that have evolved defenses against cells becoming cancerous. They divide only in the right place and at the right time. And information is DNA in, in DNA is protected against changes, mutations, and uh, by correction mechanisms that I've briefly mentioned. And only a small minority of cells are immortal, and these are the stem cells. So to return to Darwinian selection, we have seen that there's a capacity of the cell population to overproduce, but Darwinian selection has evolved defenses against cells becoming cancerous. To what extent is there variation in the cell population? Well, by mutation, um, shown here by change of this C to a T, or shown here by breakage in DNA and joining to the wrong piece, or by eliminating, erasing part of the genetic information, such as the tumor suppressor gene, uh, or making additional copies of information, such as causes trouble with oncogenes. So mutations cause variation in our DNA, and they cause variation in how our cells behave, and they're the raw material for Darwinian selection, particularly uh, worrying when they have mutated oncogenes or tumor suppressor genes, because Darwinian selection can then select for cells that divide too fast and in the wrong place at the wrong time. So I mentioned earlier that one type of tumor suppressor gene is the breast cancer susceptibility gene, uh, BRCA2 or BRCA2. And you've all seen it when traveling by train from Cambridge, there's Addenbrooke's Hospital, by traveling from train by train from Cambridge to London. Just as you come past Addenbrooke's, there is this double helix and the start of the cycle path to Shelford, which has the sequence of the BRCA2 gene uh, shown uh, with the four letters shown in, in red, yellow, green, and blue um, on the, the cycle path. So what does BRCA2 do? Well, it helps to keep our chromosomes in good shape. These are normal chromosomes, each one stained uh, in a way that each chromosome is stained a different color. I won't go into how, but each chromosome should just be one color. So each pair of chromosomes, parental, uh, maternal, and paternal chromosomes, should each be a single color in a normal cell. In a cell which has lost both copies of BRCA2, um, then yes, you need a siren like the one going past the window. Um, because if you look at these chromosomes, something's gone wrong. Here's a chromosome uh, consisting of two different parts, one from one type of chromosome, one from another. Here's one which has one piece of chromosome inserted in uh, chromosomes of a different type. Here again, two different chromosomes have joined together. There's been breakage and incorrect rejoining of the chromosome ends. They failed to rejoin to their correct partner. This one should have rejoined to this one. Instead, they've, joined all, they've misjoined all over the place. Um, there is chromosomal mayhem, uh, and uh, this so-called translocations can activate oncogenes and inactivate tumor suppressor genes, resulting in cancer. So, I'm going to show you another illustration of genetic change that results in cancer. This is neuroblastoma, uh, a, a disease which is particularly uh, tragic in that it occurs frequently in, in children. Um, and what's happened here is this yellow DNA uh, in the chromosome should be a single small spot of a gene called NMYC. But the cell um, has accidentally overcopied NMYC and nat natural selection, Darwinian selection, has resulted in that cell being favored, uh, proliferating more than it should, and it's done it again, and again, that gives a growth advantage to this cell. It will go on dividing when it shouldn't and produce a, a neuroblastoma tumor. So that's bad news, because in neuroblastoma where the gene has not been copied uh, as much as 10 times, um, prospect of survival of those patients is very good. Where the gene has been copied and is present in more than 10 copies, uh, the prospect of survival of those patients is appallingly bad. So another example of the same phenomenon is the HER2 dune, uh, the HER2, let me say it again, the HER2 gene in breast cancer, where again, patients with amplified HER2 gene 
uh, oncogene uh, have a much worse prospect of survival than those um, who have not amplified the, um, the HER2 gene. This is particularly relevant because um, monoclonal antibody against the product of this gene, uh, it, um, that antibody is called Herceptin, and of course monoclonal antibodies were invented by a former fellow of, uh, of Darwin, the, the late Cesar Milstein, um, and an antibody, a humanized antibody, made by, um, initially by, by Cesar's methods and then adapted, um, is a very effective treatment against um, breast cancer in patients who have a, an amplified HER2 gene. So Darwinian selection has resulted, uh, selection has evolved defenses against cells becoming cancerous, and it's evolved mechanisms that minimize variation in normal cells, but cancer cells are selected for their ability to have increased variation, increased mutation in their oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes, and therefore increased uh, variation, uh, therefore increased variation in their uh, DNA and allowing the raw material for Darwinian selection for the fastest growing cell. So we come back to this paradox what is Darwinian selection really for? For survival of the fittest cell or the fittest individual? Um, and there is a perverse selection going on in our bodies for a selfish cancer cell. Paradoxically, Darwinian selection could select for the fastest dividing cell that arises from repeated cycles of mutation. But if that happens, um, it can have deleterious consequences for the individual, a point I'll return to. So if we look at the behavior of, of a cell during our early development, it will divide until there is the correct number of cells of that population, and it will then be maintained, that tissue will be maintained at the correct number of cells, with cells being turned over but replaced at the same rate. Um, and that's what should happen. But if unregular, if a cancer cell forms, seen here as the red cell, then um, it can form a clone of uh, mutated cancer cells, which then can undergo further mutation and further evolution to become increasingly aggressive. This is why catching cancer early is so important, before it's accumulated multiple mutations that make it uh, increasingly aggressive and increasingly difficult to treat. So to return to the perverse selection for the selfish cancer cell, paradoxically Darwinian selection could select for the fastest dividing cell that arises from repeated cycles of DNA mutations. But tumor cells that have lost DNA repair mechanisms and checkpoints can therefore evolve faster because their DNA mutates faster. And they become more aggressive as they mutate faster. That only happens within limits because if they become completely irresponsible in copying their DNA uh, completely inaccurately, then the cell will die. It can't simply survive. But this poses a problem that um, there is a selection going on within the cells of our body that if a cell can escape from these mechanisms that have kept cancer at a low level, um, if they can escape from those uh, and can vary, they become material for selection of the cancer cell within the body. However, the short-term advantage to the selfish cell is a disadvantage to the patient, and it's the patient that is the unit of Darwinian selection rather than the cell. So fortunately, evolution has selected against antisocial behavior by our cells um, by making this a very difficult event for a, cell, a selfish cell to arise. So selective pressures have ensured um, that survival of the fittest cell uh, is only short-term and would be selected against by selection against cancer cells and evolving mechanisms that make, uh, that defend us against uh, uh, tumors becoming cancerous. I'm going to finish by looking at um, how cancer treatments provide Darwinian selection against the cancer cell and in favor of the individual, and how Darwinian selection then becomes a further complication in cancer treatments. 
And I'm going to look, I'm going to take you back to chronic myeloid leukemia in which an oncogene called C. able becomes activated by a break in a chromosome which then joins to the wrong chromosome to activate C. able in the leukemic cell. Um, and that has been fought by development of a drug called Gleevec, which, or imatinib, which is specifically designed to inactivate that oncogene called ABLE. And it does so. This is a, a schematic diagram of what the protein, the ABLE protein, looks like. It's a signaling molecule that tells cells to divide. Gleevec inserts in a pocket, and it's designed to make a snug fit into that pocket, switching off uh, the ABLE signaling molecule and uh, therefore preventing the cell from the cancerous cell from dividing. And what happens as you increase the concentration of Gleevec is the signaling from the ABLE oncogene is switched off. These are two different patients and their cells uh, proliferation is switched off by Gleevec. Um, and this is a blood smear before treatment with lots of far too many white blood cells, and this is after treatment. I'm sorry they're different scales, but I borrowed this book, uh, I borrowed this image from a book in which the, the scales were different. But as you see, there are less white blood cells per red cell than there are before treatment. So it's a very effective treatment. But there is then Darwinian selection again for the drug-resistant cells during therapy. And I showed you the two blue lines, but what happens if you take the cells from the patient after they've been treated with Gleevec? Sometime later, their cells have become completely resistant to the drug Gleevec. This is very similar to antibiotic resistance in bacteria, but it's chemotherapy resistance in cancer cells. And what is happening is as Gleevec kills off the original tumor cell, a mutation that provides resistance to Gleevec can now arise and you get a resistant population growing out. And there are multiple ways that this comes about. I've I'm going to illustrate two. First, in a normal cell, the able oncogene should just show up as this tiny yellow spot. But after selection of the cell for resistance to Gleevec, you can get an enormous piece of DNA encoding the able the able oncogene. So it's made so much DNA devoted to making this gene, it's making so much of this gene product that Gleevec can no longer switch it off. A second subtle way of resisting Gleevec is seen here. This is Gleevec in its pocket in the protein, and it should be flanked by this amino acid called threonine. But some Gleevec mutation uh, arises from mutation of this amino acid to this one, isoleucine, that has a bulge that reaches into the pocket and stops Gleevec from binding. And so, uh, in this way, Darwinian selection, uh, or pseudo-Darwinian selection, because it's selecting for the abnormal cell rather than the individual, uh, and is allowing the cell to bypass the selection agent, Gleevec, uh, and the tumor becomes drug-resistant. So my final point is can we target the cancer cells' advantages uh, to turn them to the advantage of so-called advantages, the things that allow the cancer cell to proliferate when it shouldn't, can we exploit that to the advantage of the patient? And I'm going to show one example uh, to finish on. And that is to return to patients who've inherited a faulty BRCA2 gene and therefore have a very high risk of breast cancer. And I've shown you that BRCA2 causes instability of the genome. But it does so because what's happened is a particular type of precise DNA repair mechanism has been inactivated by the loss of the gene that should carry it out. So these are now susceptible. Uh, these cells uh, don't repair their DNA correctly by that method, but they have another method that keeps them alive. They have another way to repair DNA. But a drug has been developed um, uh, here in Cambridge, a, a PARP inhibitors. Um, PARP stands for a horribly long word that I'll spare you as I've run out of time. Um, though if anyone wishes to ask the question in the questions, you, you may regret it. Um, but I, I shall 
spare you that, um, as this is my last data slide. Um, the bracket, cells that have lost BRCA2 can no longer repair their DNA by one pathway, so they're dependent on this other pathway that's inhibited by these PARP inhibitors developed by my former colleague Steve Jackson um, here in Cambridge and his colleagues. And normal cells shrug off PARP inhibitors. This is a dose, a drug concentration, a logarithmic drug concentration curve, and it takes massive doses of PARP inhibitors to trouble normal cells or cells with one uh, damaged uh, BRCA2 gene. So even if you've inherited one dud gene from a parent, uh, you still tolerate this drug very, very well. But if you've got two dud, uh, if you've got two uh, damaged genes, one inherited from a parent and the other arising through carcinogenesis in your body, then those cells are a thousand times more sensitive uh, to uh, this particular drug, uh, the PARP inhibitor, and therefore the tumor cells preferentially die. This again in clinical trials has been very, very promising. Um, it does prolong uh, the life of women with BRCA2 mu mutation uh, in, in their tumors, but um, unfortunately, of course, the problem of resistance to drugs in chemotherapy arises, and that is now currently under investigation to see if a combination of this drug with others could, um, could uh, prevent that problem. So what I've told you then is the capacity of the cell population to overproduce does occur, just as it does for individuals in the, the population Darwin was thinking about, but the Darwinian selection has evolved defenses that protect us against a free-for-all of our cells to overproduce. Variation within the cell population occurs, but it's m absolutely minimized in our normal cells by correction mechanisms that keep them precise to type. Whereas um, in cancer cells, there is an advantage to the selfish cancer cell to switch off the mechanisms that keep our DNA uh, safe and prevent variation from occurring. The cancer cell thrives on variation. And finally, selective pressures, survival of the fittest cell is an illusion because the, if the, that cell tries to overproliferate, it will be only to a short-term advantage and can lead to the death of the individual. Um, but selection of the individual is by selection against cancer cells by the principles that I've already uh, illustrated. So my final summary then is that selection against cancer cell production and survival has occurred in, evolu in our evolutionary past, that selection against mutations and for stable DNA have also occurred in our evolutionary past, but paradoxically, selective advantage to cancer cells of mutations and unstable DNA allows the cancer cell to evolve rapidly but that selective advantage to the cancer cell of overproduction uh, is an illusion. It's only a short-term advantage as it leads to the long-term disadvantage of the patient containing those cells. And, so I've also, and finally, I've shown that selection for drug-resistant cells in cancer therapy is a crucial uh, feature of Darwinian selection that affects cancer treatments profoundly. And the targeting the cancer cell's apparent advantages uh, can uh, be turned on their heads to the disadvantage of the cancer cell and promoting the survival of the patient, as I've illustrated by the PARP inhibitors at the end. So thank you.